Welcome to the Impact of Healthcare Reform on Family Caregivers, an hour-long webinar to provide an overview of how healthcare reform impacts and includes family caregivers. I'm Kathleen Kelly, Executive Director of Family Care Alliance and the National Center on Caregiving, and I will be the moderator for this program. This webinar is jointly sponsored by Family Caregiver Alliance, the National, National Family Caregivers Association, and the National Alliance for Caregiving. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. Our panelists will present for approximately 30 minutes, leaving time for questions at the end. To ask a question, please enter your question in the box appearing at the right-hand side of your screen titled Question Box. Due to the large number of participants, we will not be able to take questions on the phone. This pres presentation will be archived on the Family Caregiver Alliance website, caregiver.org. The PowerPoint slides and background materials are available to download on the Family Caregiver Alliance website and through all parts of the website. The Health Care Reform Act offers for the first time in decades an approach to fixing access to health insurance for those without coverage, both with pre-existing conditions, ending rescission for loss of coverage by insurance companies, and extending coverage to adult children up to age 26. However, the bill also addresses health care quality, financing, work. It is within these components where we find family caregivers not only identified within the health care system, but also involved caregivers in a meaningful way as part of the health care team in the project. With the election class, health care reform was by three candidates be targeted for repeal or for budget cuts in the implementation of the programs addressing quality and financing changes within the system. This is why we offer some practical suggestions on how to get more involved with advocacy and education of both professionals and family caregivers to retain health care reform in its present form. In particular, the CLASS Act, the first publicly financed long-term care policy that provides direct support to family caregivers in the future is already under attack. We need the information from this presentation and from those leading advocacy on health care reform implementation efforts to be widely disseminated so family caregivers and those who need assistance can be informed of the facts and the direction of this important policy development. With us today are two panelists, Suzanne Mintz, Executive Director of the National Family Caregivers Association, and Gail Hunt, CEO of the National Alliance for, Care, for Caregiving, our panelists today. I will introduce them in the order of their presentation. Suzanne is President and CEO of the National Family Caregivers Association. She took a personal experience, her husband's diagnosis of MS, and from it built a national organization to improve the lives of family caregivers. In 2006, 15 winners of the first ever Purpose Prize, a national award for Americans 60 and above who are leading a new age of social innovation. She is a frequent speaker on family caregiving, caregiver issues and is the author of multiple articles and three books. Joining her uh, is, is Gail Hunt. Gail is the CEO of the National Alliance for Caregiving, a nonprofit coalition dedicated to conducting research and developing national programs for family caregivers and the professionals who serve them. Prior to heading NAC, Ms. Hunt was president of her own aging services consulting firm for 14 years where she conducted corporate elder care research and the National Institute on Aging, for the National Institute on Aging and Social Security Administration, developed training for caregivers with AARP and the American Occupational Therapy Association and designed corporate elder care programs. It is with pleasure that we begin our presentation this morning with Suzanne. Hello, and let me extend my thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the overview that Kathy presented. Um, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, which is its formal name, most people are referring to it now as the Affordable Care Act. Um, 
And it is touching our lives in multiple ways. Some of them don't directly mention family caregivers. But because they are about the person cared for, they affect family caregivers as well. Because as you know, the two are totally, totally integrated. The insurance reforms, no more denial of pre-existing conditions that has already been put in place. And uh, some people are applying to get health insurance now, where they never could have before. The, get the caps that many insurance companies put on how much you can get in a year or in a lifetime are being removed. And the vast majority of Americans will have access to affordable insurance coverage through the exchanges when they are put in place. And um, prescription drug costs are going to go down. Many seniors have received already a check for $250. And the effort is underway to close the donor hole that's in, in Part D. And so, all of these together are mechanisms that uh, make life easier and better and healthier for both patients and family caregivers. Next. Other aspects of the bill that have a profound effect on all of us, really, is the effort to build our primary care workforce. As you know, Doctors tend to go into the specialties because they get a higher pay. And um, so there is a shortage of primary care physicians as well as nurses. And within the bill, there is funding and mechanisms to encourage people to go into these fields. Because as more people come on the roles of health insurance, we're obviously going to need to put in place the people who are going to be able to, to care for them. Direct care workers, the people who family caregivers rely on so much to, to get a break, to help them provide care, often don't have training. It is a state-by-state -state issue. Some states have requirements and other states do not. And so funding to help better prepare direct care workers to be uh, as professional as they can be and reliable for family caregivers is another piece of, um, of the bill. And there is some training, albeit very small, the family caregivers of the elderly that is encompassed within the, within the bill. And more training for family caregivers obviously is, is needed. Um, maybe the biggest change is how health care is provided and, and paid for, that uh, now physicians are paid based on the quantity of procedures that they do, the number of flu shots that they give, the number of um, colonoscopies. And they are not paid for taking the time to talk with patients and families to monitor symptoms. And with chronic conditions, that, of course, is what is needed because they do not have, have a cure. Um, they're also going to need, providers are also going to need to think about care in a different way because our system is provider-centric. And the being called for making it become patient and, as appropriate, family-centered care. That's a 180-degree difference from what we have at this point. And the bane of family caregivers, the coordination of care, which tends to fall on caregivers' shoulders because nobody else is doing it, will now become uh, the province of the paid provider community. And that is the key word. Physicians will be to provide some level of care coordination. And um, this is all within the innovation centers which we will be, be talking about. And so these are, again, ways that don't necessarily mention family caregivers, but which will obviously affect family caregivers. Next. We have identified 
um, within the bill 15 specific sections that talk about family caregivers. And then there are six advisory boards and commissions that are being put together that also mention family caregivers um, and consumers. Some of those boards uh, have already been established. The Patient-Centered Outcomes-Based Research Institute has already named uh, people to its board, and others are underway. Um, as you can see, we put all of these into categories to make it more understandable. And what I think is extraordinary, really, is that there's actually a category of long-term care. Because, as you know, we have always worked in silos in this country. With health care and with home and community-based services, and never the twain shall meet. Um, Persons with chronic conditions whose family caregivers are paying for know full well that uh, they can't be split in part, in half, that they need both health care and home and community based care services that generally uh, under the term of long term care. So that really is a very significant, significant piece. Next, please. When we look at the sections that mention family caregivers, the ones that jump out at us as being of most significance is the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is within CMS. The purpose of this center is going to be to test different models of care that will get us to the payment reform and the higher quality that um, that everybody is, is looking for. The center is getting ready to gear up. It has a director. And um, we will have to wait and see what comes out of it. But there is a lot of hope that the center will bring to bear and show us all ways of transforming our healthcare system. Another significant aspect is that it is focused on patient and family-centered care. As I mentioned before, um, the Outcomes-Based Research Institute, its full name being Patient-Centered Outcomes-Based Research. And that's not things we've heard a lot about in healthcare reform. So that's a significant aspect. And then, as I mentioned, the models of care that treat the whole purpose, the uh, whole person, but that is again one of the most significant aspects of um, of healthcare reform. Next, please. So the CMS Innovation Center is established to do two things. It is established to improve the care and enhance the quality of services that we are provided. At the same time, looking at cost reductions, because we all know that the costs cannot be sustainable. And so it's pretty straightforward in its goal, but making it happen is not going to be easy, because it will turn everything on its head in the way it is practiced now. Uh, physicians will be paid differently. They will need to be trained differently. Now physicians you know, work independently. Uh, the new models of care all talk about teams. And so that is going to be a huge change in how medicine is actually practiced. And uh, there are some entities that practice this way now. There's some of the uh, systems whose names you've heard of, the Mayo Clinic, Kaiser Permanente, Weisinger, they all work within these new paradigms. And the goal, of course, is to get more and more of American healthcare to work within these uh, paradigms as well. Next. The actual concept of the center is really innovative because it's a federal program, but it's not going to have to 
play by all of the rules that um, other agencies and programs have to play by. And that means that the Secretary does not have to go back to Congress to turn a pilot into a national program. She has the authority to do that right now. And that is very significant. It means that those pilots and demos that show promise can very quickly be brought to the, to the mainstream. One of the biggest problems in implementing change uh, within the government has always been the fact that the Congressional Budget Office only looks at upfront costs. It does not look at the benefits and the reduction in costs, you know, 10 years, 10 years out. And so a lot of things get what uh, a, a bad score is the terminology that uh, everybody believes is going to save money down the road. So within the Innovation Center, the rules are that projects and programs can spend money to build its infrastructure and um, their other costs while it's initially being tested so that that prohibition won't be there. Um, that often is a program outside of the center. And there have been 20 different models listed that the secretary has the authority to select. But what's really neat is that she can pick those that seem most suited to meet the overall objectives of the center. And that's why the concept really is um, quite innovative. Next slide, please. Some of the details. Um, we talked about patient and family-centered care. That comes into play when um, models of care that really focus on putting the family member and uh, the patient at the center of the care team itself. Family caregivers in many of these models will be considered actual members of their loved one's health care team. And again, most physicians work in a silo. Most practices in this country have one or two or, or three physicians at, at most. And so within these new uh, models that are being tested, doctors will be able to share information um, with patients, of course, but also with caregivers. And they're going to be able to do it on a real-time basis because electronical medical records are being the ability to have them becoming more available, not so much through the Affordable Care Act, but um, through the provisions of an act that was put in place last year. And then also, as I've been mentioning, for the first time within these programs, doctors will get paid for doing care coordination for sharing the data electronically, for measuring performance and quality improvement. And that is a significant piece, is the improvement in the quality of care that, um, that people are receiving. And so you can see how different these things are from the way healthcare is practiced, is practiced today. Um, next, please. As we talked about before, the whole person is going to be treated in um, many of the models being tested. And some of the specific ones include the Independence at Home Demonstration Project. And Gail will go into details about what that program actually, actually means. Um, there is another uh, program that will help educate patients and families so that they can make decisions regarding a, um, a operation or some other um, situation that is, that is being uh, proposed because there will be mechanisms um, 
so that they can learn about the various options and then make informed decisions with other members of the healthcare team. And this talks about not only the healthcare outcomes, but also things that would relate to uh, a patient's need for um, additional assistance um, because of their uh, condition and the uh, decision that they, that they made. Um, another aspect of treating the whole person, and this is one of my personal favorites, are the community health team support, to support patient-centered medical homes. This gets back to the point I made that 85 percent of practices are really very tiny and won't have the capacity to do the kinds of coordination and sharing of information that is being projected. And so community health teams will contract with other entities and with various position groups to provide these services for them. And the section specifically mentions that it will be about coordinated care across the health and social service um, sector. Next, please. And um, at this point, yeah. Dan is going to take over and talk to you about uh, the patient and family centered care aspects of um, these 15 different sections that talk about family care. Hi, everyone. Uh, I, I'm just kind of picking up a little bit. It's a little bit of overlap, I think, with what Suzanne has just gone through. But just wanted to be sure that you all understood uh, some of the areas that deal specifically with patient and family-centered care. Uh, she's mentioned accountable care organizations that are going to be set up around the country. The independence at home demonstration, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. Medication therapy management is really where the pharmacist is uh, going to be helping the patient and the families have a better understanding of their prescriptions what they mean and why the person is, uh, is taking them. Uh, Suzanne talked about empowering the patient under the program to facilitate shared decision making, uh, the community health homes she just talked about, uh, and the CLASS Act, which uh, I'm going to also go into a little more detail on. The other thing that we haven't mentioned, because it doesn't deal specifically with family caregivers, but it's a really important concept for you to keep in mind in dealing with uh, health care reform is comparative effectiveness research. And that's where um, you take uh, evidence-based uh, evidence outcomes for, say, a medication, a type of surgery, um, maybe watchful waiting, um, maybe radiation, a whole spectrum of options for one particular uh, illness or uh, type of cancer or uh, knee replacement or whatever it is. And there's definitely going to be uh, uh, looking at the patient and the family will be looking at not only what these options, the pros and cons of each option under uh, outcomes, but how do they compare in terms of cost? Because as I'm sure you all are aware, the, the, one of the, the uh, concepts that Suzanne mentioned under healthcare reform is uh, saving money for the country. Next, please. So I thought we'd, I'd talk a little bit about two of the, in a little more depth, just about two of the things that deal particularly uh, may have implications for family caregivers. One is the independence at home demonstration. The other is the CLASS Act. Um, independence at home is really focused on health care for uh, the most vulnerable Medicare beneficiaries. They're going to have a coordinated team made up of the doctor and nurse practitioner and a social worker who are going to be working on home and community-based care. There's going to be uh, uh, ongoing assessment 
of both the uh, uh, patient and the physician and their interaction, um, education about the patient and family caregiver about treatment. That's one of the things that I was talking about, for example, under comparative effectiveness research. A shared savings program with a minimum, supposed to be a minimum of 5% savings to Medicare by enabling the person to stay in the home and by enabling the patient and the family caregiver to be better informed and for better co care coordination as we, as Suzanne talked about earlier. And one thing that's going to be kind of a standout here is the fact that there will be surveys of the patient and the family's experience and their satisfaction with the process. And those kinds of um, Obje objective um, evaluation forms that will be uh, given on the satisfaction with the whole process have been shown to really uh, have much more of an impact on the physicians, uh, uh, the way that they practice, and the way that they have, I guess, more bedside manner, for example, and the way that they deal with the uh, uh, with the patient and family, and are they are they um, doing it in a way that really makes them a part of the whole team deciding on whatever uh, objectives are going to be moving forward next. And uh, the other one I'm going to mention in a little more detail is the CLASS Act, which is, um, if implemented in the long haul, really has the potential of being a um, creating a national long-term care insurance uh, program for the country, which everyone knows we don't have now, and, uh, and really reshaping the way that long-term care is paid for in the long haul, this is. It's a program that is um, opt-out, voluntary program opt-out, for both employees and employers. So employers are going to have to be talked into or see the advantages of offering this program to their employees, as well as employees are going to have to understand how it's in their best interest uh, to stay in and not opt out of the, uh, the program. And really the idea here is to uh, get in as many healthy 25-year-olds and 27-year-olds uh, as we possibly can so that they can balance the people who are taking money out of the program because they, they need long-term care. So it's going to be payroll deductions uh, similar to the way Social Security works, but probably not going through the Social Security system. Now, the enrollment doesn't start until 2013, and then you have five years to pay into the program. So the earliest that people could be taking out is probably like 2018, 2019. And the way it's going to work is that if you have two activities of daily living, you need assistance with bathing and dressing or feeding, toileting, transferring, um, you will be able to get a minimum of uh, $50 a day out of the uh, program as it stands now. Uh, the actual benefit will depend on the level of disability. If you have three or more ADL needs, then you'll be able to get some additional uh, benefit out of the program. And the thing that's really important, actually, is that this program is not underwritten. So anyone who has uh, a disability or who's um, has the Alzheimer's or whatever the issue is, if they are working and they're paying in for the five years, they're eligible for the program. That's very important because as it stands now, in order for you to get long, private long-term care insurance, you have, to, um, you have to be underwritten. And the money, the $50 a day plus, uh, benefit that you get can really is going to be like cash that the uh, enrollee, the person who's enrolled who now has the two plus ADL needs, will be able to spend on whatever services they want, whatever goods or services they want. So for example, they can pay uh, their daughter 
to uh, be able to provide services to them. Or they can pay for um, assistive technology for their home. Or they can pay for their neighbor. Or they can pay for uh, services in the community, uh, adult daycare, or whatever services are necessary. But they're going to be able to make the decision about what they want. And there's no lifetime limit on the program. So um, you pay in the five years at a minimum. But then if you become uh, disabled and need have two or more ADLs, you can have a life, no lifetime limit on what you can take out. Next, please. So I'm going to talk just very briefly, because I know that there's no way that this part people could kind of keep up with, but a little bit about the implementation timeline we have. So we really went from 2010, which is this year, to 2000 to 2015, and already either started or implemented are some of the insurance reforms that Suzanne talked about, uh, coverage for insurance uh, for kids through the age of 26, uh, which is something that a lot of middle class people were looking forward to, the filling of the donut hole that's in Part D, and I'm sure those of you dealing with uh, aging clients or Medicare beneficiaries know that that's something that people are really excited about. And then there's been quite a bit of additional funding that's gone to um, pay for community health centers to expand the access to primary care. In uh, next year, we're going to have the innovation center that Suzanne talked about uh, really get up and uh, start going. And then we'll also have preventive health coverage without uh, co-pays or an, an, an annual physical without uh, co-pays as well. And you might also take a look at um, what will be happening under Welcome to Medicare and how they've really beefed up the prevention aspects of uh, the Welcome to Medicare exam, including, for example, a depression screening. And then they're going to be establishing the community-based care transition teams program in uh, next year, in 2011 as well. Next, please. Next slide, please. There we go. So between 2012 and 2015, pretty much the rest of the kinds of things that we've been talking about, the accountable care organizations, starting to link payments to quality, which is one of the things that Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has very, been very uh, vocal about. And uh, Don Berwick, the new head, has been particularly uh, interested in that. And then hospitals that readmit people for the same issue within 30 days will start seeing some penalties. There will be an increase in the tax deduction, which is currently, uh, for medical expenses, is currently 7.5% uh, of gross income. That will go up to 10%. There will be the state exchanges and the health insurance mandate, which really requires people to uh, begin to have health insurance in one form or another. Um, the complete elimination of annual uh, limits on coverage so that if you uh, are, are hit with cancer or, some, or something that's some kind of surgery that's very expensive, you'll be able to not have to, uh, to worry that you're going to run out of your coverage within a year. And then uh, lastly, the uh, Independent Payment Advisory Board, which is actually going to be looking at the issues of um, uh, how we go about paying and, and actually making decisions about how we go about paying for uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And I would also just like to mention, it's not on this, uh, but um, I think it's, and it's not on here because it's not part of health care reform. But it will be very important to be keeping an eye on how the implementation of health, uh, electronic health records goes, because physicians will begin to be being paid, as well as hospitals being paid, for developing electronic health records that, as Suzanne said, uh, speak to each other. Next page, please. Next overhead, thanks. So in sort of keeping the momentum of the family caregiver side of uh, health care reform alive, we had a couple of suggestions that, that you all could make. 
uh, you all could follow through on. When you're talking with state or local officials, it's all, of course, always important to talk about family caregiving in policies and programs related to chronic illness. And the states are going to be especially important in implementing health care reform. As I'm sure as everyone knows, the uh, Medicaid is a joint state-federal program, and the states are really looking at what they're uh, going to be able to do. So it's important to keep family caregivers sort of top of mind with them. When you actually, if you're actually going forward to your own senators and representatives, uh, it's important that they keep the CMS Innovation Center as a really um, good component in reducing health care costs. And we mention this because there's funding that's been um, uh, set aside in health care reform but there's some indication that that's going to be one of the, uh, the places that uh, perhaps the, the new Congress is going to turn to make cuts. But yet that innovation, innovation center is going to be one of the keys in reducing health care costs. So that they can really look at programs that are going to be different that might be innovative, as their innovation center says, that will allow us to reduce reduce health care costs. Um, also, at the state level, uh, you really should join, be thinking about joining with others um, in the pilots and the demonstration projects that are going to be developed, uh, particularly like through the uh, maybe state health and social services agency, the governor's office, the Medicaid agency. Just be alert to the fact that they are going to be having those uh, kinds of uh, projects. And uh, then also remember that the Older Americans Act is going to be reauthorized next year. Uh, you can check it out at AOA.gov. And the National Family Caregiver Support Program, of course, is a part of that as well. Next, please. You'll see here that there are three organizations, at a minimum, that are sending out e-newsletters. Um, I would say the Campaign for Better Care is one, the first one mentioned there, that has uh, really been focused on both um, older people and their family caregivers and has uh, quite a, an extensive uh, um, group that's looking at the issues constantly of uh, health care reform. And then there's Families USA and NFCA group as well. Next, please. Then there are websites that kind of keep track of what's happening so far. And RWJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, their website is really uh, sort of maintaining information on where we've gotten so far. So if you're looking at like what's being implemented now, what's being implemented in the next few months and all that, that's a particularly good website to go to along with the other two that are here. Next, please. And here are uh, four reports, including one by AOA, that, found, that have actually looked at the whole issues of uh, long-term care and uh, not so much family caregiving, but uh, long-term care as it plays out in health care reform. And they would be also valuable for you. If you don't get these, if you can't write it down quickly enough, as Kathy said, uh, this is going to be archived on uh, her website. So you can go back and look at these, as well as uh, I think it's going to be, uh, we'll have the PowerPoints on both Suzanne's and the Alliance's website. And last, please. And just thank you from all, uh, all three of our organizations for uh, participating. And I'm going to turn this over to Kathy for the Q&A. Thank you, Gail and Suzanne. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions uh, from participants. Uh, and uh, one of the first questions that came in is, uh, is the Independence at Home demonstration uh, project targeting specific illnesses? Or, and, and what is the definition of a vulnerable Medicare beneficiary? Um, Gail, would you like to address that question? 
Uh, actually, I'd like to turn that over to Suzanne because I know that she's been the most uh, heavily involved in uh, Independence at Home. Uh, thanks. The, um, the program is not targeted at specific diseases, but it is targeted at the most expensive Medicare beneficiaries. And off the top of my head, I don't know uh, whether it's the top 2% or, or exactly what that um, number is, but it is focused on the most expensive Medicare beneficiaries. And it's because of that and the fact that uh, programs like this have already existed that they know that they can save um, money just by people being cared for at, at home. And that's why there's this guaranteed saving that is, that is put into the, into the bill. So it's not disease-based. It is extent of illness and related costs that um, are the drivers. Uh, and the next question is, can you provide any more detailed information about how the medication therapy management program will look and where to find more information about it? Wow. It's my understanding that nothing has really been done yet about that, but um, the National Association of Chain Drug Stores Foundation um, we'll be having a presentation by somebody from CMS within the next few weeks, and so we should know more then. And uh, I'm assuming we have everybody's emails, and so we could answer that question uh, down the pipe here. Dale, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I don't. No, I'm trying to, yeah, keep these really brief so we can get in as many questions as we possibly can. Okay. The uh, next question is about the CLASS program. Which federal agency will administer CLASS, and are they currently writing regulations? And if so, do you have any sense of when the proposed regulations will be available for comment? Um, I. I only know rumors about uh, where the CLAF Act will be uh, housed, uh, so I'm not, uh, I don't think I want to say. I know that there's been a, a number of agencies that have been considered uh, and I think uh, probably rejected for a variety of reasons. Um, it's, I do know that ASPE, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, they are writing the regulations. They are deciding all of these issues like uh, who determines eligibility and, uh, you know, who is it, is it a doc, for example, that decides, is it always the doc that decides about that? Uh, and, but they won't come out with their regs, I don't think, until the announcement is made in the secretary's office about where this will be housed. And that decision has not been released. There is an organization that has been started um, to focus specifically on the CLASS Act. It's called Advanced CLASS, which is a great name, advancedclass.org. And they're just getting going, so I don't know that there's a whole lot of stuff on their website, but that would be a good place to check back in with. Yeah, and just uh, uh, mentioning on top of that, Advanced CLASS is an advocacy organization, a nonprofit advocacy organization, as opposed to uh, the government agency that is going to be uh, actually doing the implementation. And there is actually also, the, in the works, a government agency to implement. That's, but that's what we don't know exactly where that's going to be placed. There are a number of questions about um, the elections last week and the impact on um, health care reform. And a number of the questions center around uh, which parts of health care reform 
um, will might be targeted by this new Congress. Um, can they succeed? Um, and you know what happens uh, with health care reform if the if President Obama is not reelected in 2012? Can we uh, start to address some of the the uh, trends? Uh, or some, some preliminary work that's been done uh, by members of Congress to try to roll back uh, all health care reform. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit there, Kathy. Um, but as, as I, my understanding is that uh, it can't be re repealed, really. The chances are highly unlikely that it could be repealed. Uh, while Obama is president, because he would veto it, and they don't have enough votes in the Senate to override. However, what they are talking about is starving it to death. So uh, taking those pieces, and we've mentioned two of them. One is the Innovation Center for CMS, which actually, as we pointed out, ironically might be something that would save money. And also the CLAS Act, which also ironically is something that might save money over the long haul, um, certainly over the short haul. Those are two pieces that have been talked about being starved to death by just not having the money appropriated to do the job. Yeah, I would, um, this is Kathy, and I would just like to add, on the state side, there have been um, nationally a number of lawsuits that are in progress that contend that uh, the insurance purchase requirement is unconstitutional. Um, one judge in Michigan threw out uh, a challenge, a decision that may be appealed. Another suit was filed by Virginia. The third, led by Florida, involves 20 states and could, given the election outcome, end up with more signing on. So there, there are some movements at the state level as well. But um, at this point, the trend in finding them to be upheld uh, hasn't uh, has really panned out, but that doesn't mean that there won't be more possibly challenges of the um, there is. Um, you know, I think that the people who have already benefited, the, the parents who have twenty-something kids, uh, seniors who are affected by the the donut hole. Uh, people with pre-existing conditions, that they could certainly be part of a grassroots effort to maintain the law because they would understand, you know, in a, a real-life context, how valuable it is um, for them. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we see things of that nature. And Again, I would think Families USA and the National Partnership um, are good places to look to see what's happening on the grassroots side. There are a number of comments about um, looking at the Veterans um, Health Administration for the innovations that the, that the veterans have put in uh, place. Uh, through their uh, community care and long-term care programs. And I want to acknowledge that, um, that the Veterans, are, uh, Veterans Administration uh, has made great strides and really are a thought leader and a key leader in being able to test these programs uh, within the VA system uh, in a faster turnaround, perhaps, than we can with, um, with programs uh, uh, at the federal level. Uh, but I also want to just mention that we don't have time to go into the VA program, but we will be focusing in a later uh, webinar uh, after the first of the year on the VA programs that have, are, are in place and will be put in place through the new um, omnibus bill for caregiver support. Uh, so we'll talk more about that later uh, next spring. Uh, one of the qu other questions was about the... Um, the, um, the direct care, has anyone, uh, anything been done for direct care providers, training direct care providers? And I would just like to answer that by saying that 
uh, we'll put this out on uh, off on the website. We'll add it to the list of places to go to check for information. Uh, that's the Paraprofessional Health Institute has a fact sheet on how uh, health care reform affects training of direct care work. So we'll go ahead and post that um, piece of information uh, as a separate component, an additional component, to the resource that we already put in place. Uh, if can, uh, this one last question, or just about out of time, about uh, any address the community-based uh, care transition projects uh, that are a part of the component um, of um, health care reform and innovation projects to go forward. Kathy, could you repeat that, please? Yeah, it was really hard. I'm sorry. Um, it's the community care transition programs. Uh, would you like to address any thoughts about the community care transitions programs? We didn't talk about those uh, much in depth. Um, there is a meeting at CMS in Baltimore on December 3rd that, where they are going to talk specifically about that program. At this point, there is uh, no information out there. So uh, people could contact um, CMS and um, it is going to be done both in person and uh, um, webinar and uh, or teleconference. And so that's what I would suggest for people who want to know, <clears throat> excuse me, more about that particular program. Well, we're coming to the end of our uh, discussion, and we do have um, a number of questions that I really uh, do apologize that we're not able to get to. Um, some we may uh, take your comments uh, and questions and um, continue this dialogue uh, further with more uh, webinar and uh, conference call discussions, especially around the question of how we can mobilize um, caregivers to be more involved uh, with health care reform since it affects so dramatically their, um, their daily lives. Uh, so with that, I would actually like to uh, thank all of our uh, participants this morning, those of you who dialed in and gave us a lot of really wonderful questions to consider uh, and directions to consider for future uh, types of events. And I would like to um, thank Suzanne Mintz and Gail Hunt for um, being our panelists this morning. And again, uh, those pieces of information and some additional information that we will uh, uh, place into our website as part of the additional resources on the PowerPoint, we will post that, um, give us till this afternoon to make the corrections, and we'll post that on our site so you can follow up with your individual interests, and we'll try to point you in the best direction. With that, I'm going to close this webinar, and I thank everybody involved. Bye.